Welcome back to another episode of Beyond the Sermon. I'm Matt Hotho, the Director of Production and Online Engagement, and I'm here with our senior pastor, McGray DeVega. McGray, we're going to talk a little bit today about your sermon that you just preached about uh, kind of kicking off our series, Living Impact, about the last 125 years of our church, the impact that it's made in the Tampa Bay community, and what it'll make in the future. So to start off with, um, you have a quote here on your iPad that's related to something important that um, you've talked about a lot in the Board of Ministry, right? Can you tell us a little bit about this quote? And maybe it didn't make it into your sermon, did it? But what it relates to your understandings of kind of ancestry, legacy, that kind of stuff. One of the most formative quotes that I read over the last couple of years uh, came from a resource called Another Way, uh, How to Live and Lead Change on Purpose. It applies to various settings, not just in a church setting. But for this context, it not only works for a church that is remembering its history, it is helpful for all of us as we think about personal legacy, the way we live, uh, how we balance thinking about the past versus the future, and remembering that in every single moment of our lives, we really aren't alone. Not only are we surrounded by the people who are our contemporaries, but we are surrounded by the voices of our past. So here is a quote that I've gone to many, many times in multiple contexts. This is again from a book called Another Way. The wisdom of our ancestors and descendants is always present and available to us. So remember to welcome them as we face the most difficult tasks of our lives. The reason I think about that is that we often think about our ancestors when we're thinking about our history, our legacy, but rarely do we welcome the voices of our descendants into the present moment. Because as hard as it is for us to think about people who've lived 125 years ago or longer, it, it is even harder to think about the presence of those who will follow us. Just like we are currently the voices of the descendants who were present in some way to our ancestors 125 years ago. We, mm-hmm. we, weren't, we weren't there 125 years ago in a physical sense, but we were there in a spiritual sort of cosmic sense because of how we are enveloped in the presence and eternity of God. So as a church is celebrating its 125th anniversary, not only do we think about those who've gone before us, We think about the real presence of those whose lives will be impacted because of our faithfulness today. It's it's kind of a reminder, too, that God's sense of time is beyond the simple progressive linear sense of time that we have come accustomed to. God's sense of time is a lot more infinite, more expansive, and a lot more mysterious, so that even today we can live with the acknowledgement of the presence of those who will come after us. McCray, in your own leadership, does that inform your decision making? Yeah, it surely it surely does. Because even even if we aren't constantly thinking about our legacy, and, and frankly, I don't think about my legacy a whole lot, it does help focus us on the present moment. That the things we do do have long term consequences. Uh, what is that uh, indigenous person, that Native American saying? It takes seven generations mm. to make any kind of lasting change. And so we think about incremental change, just like we think about vectors, sort of in that whole geometric world, Mm -hmm. that even just changing the trajectory of a person's life or an institution or a culture or society, even just being faithful to the present moment where you change your trajectory incrementally, is it like almost in a minuscule, subtle way, that seven generations from now, like in the long view of history, that simple change will dramatically alter the course of what our descendants will be discovering and experiencing in their lives. So when we talk about the problems in the world today, we feel helpless because we feel like we need to make the big change now. Sometimes, and this is not, this is not a a spirit of resignation here. Mm -hmm. It's just simply a reality that sometimes what God calls us to do is to take the faithful next step. That's it. In that generation, even. In that whole, mm-hmm. in, just within our generational context. Yeah. I mean, so that's given me a lot to think about. It may actually change the the direction of our conversation today in some ways. Great. I mean, so like uh, step-parenting, right? Okay. I, I'm, I'm very much in step-parenting right now. I've been a step-parent for about 10 years now. 
um, I, I think about when I think about how I parent my stepchildren, especially, I often tell myself and I tell others who ask, like, I'm playing the long game. Mm -hmm. And I would never have put it as I'm thinking about what my descendants would think. I mean, literally, I am thinking about what my descendants yeah. would think and what they need, yeah. what they would want. Yeah. Um, but I often use that language of the long game because it helps keep me focused on not having to make all the changes and all the impact in the next 24, 48, 72 hours, right? Not every conversation, not every argument, not every moment has to bear the weight of the entire relationship. Exactly, exactly. And so it frees me from the anxiety of parenting um, into the future, right? I'm not, I'm not anxious about that future. Mm -hmm. I'm trusting that because I'm parenting towards the long game, it's going to turn out okay. One of my favorite Hebrew passages, uh, one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament is from the book of Ecclesiastes, um, where the teacher says, God has placed a sense of eternity in our hearts so that we cannot see what God has been doing from the beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. And that is just the expansiveness of that vision of that single verse reminds us that while we are called to be faithful to the present moment, which ultimately is the only thing we can do, faithful to the present moment, to have the perspective of both the past and the future helps us see the intensity, the necessity of being faithful to that present moment um, in a way that helps us remember why this is so important for us to be faithful in the here and now without the pressure of having to make dramatic change. Right. Just be faithful to the present moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that expansiveness yeah. to, to know that there's a future, I think also gives, I mean, th I don't mean this term, I'm going to say the word progressive. I don't mean it in opposition to traditional or conservative, but more mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. literally thinking about the future mm -hmm. is sort of taking a bit of a progressive mindset right. in some way. Of course. Right? You're of literally course. thinking of, of what's going to happen for down the road. Of course. I think sometimes when we approach scripture, you read a text out of Nehemiah, right? Mm -hmm. Where he just lists all of these people who helped like build the rebuild the city, mm -hmm. right? Did all this good work. Um, I think sometimes when we read scripture, and when we're maybe in a scarcity mindset in our work in the local church, hmm. we can start thinking that everything was better in the past. Remember the 90s? I mean, I don't remember the 90s that much. I had a big youth group of 100, right? We, but Bishop Berlin has joked about this before, right? right. Remember the 90s. Right, right, right. Too often in the church world, I think sometimes we can get locked in this idea of just thinking about the past, thinking about the past, right? Right, right. right. And sometimes the biblical text can... Uh, can trick us into thinking that's okay to do, almost honoring to do that because the biblical text does record a long history right. of all the people who went before, who rebuilt those walls, who who were David's lineage and ancestors, right? All those chapters that we come across that we just skip over, whether in Chronicles or Matthew or Luke, where there's this massive genealogy, but that's important for them and it's important for us to know that history. But then if you also read closely in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. there's this refrain that you'll catch and it's actually captured lovely in the Bethel song, The Blessing, hmm. where may his favor be upon you for a thousand generations and your children and their children and their children. And, and I think what's beautiful sometimes when the biblical text does that is writing wasn't cheap. Like preserving text yeah, wasn't cheap. Right. So every character you put on that page huh. was a commitment. Huh. Not only when you did that genealogy, but you could have said, and your children, yeah. And we're good. That would have been it. But they decided to just add a few more characters, right? To make it clear that it was, it was a superlative. Wow. It was and your children wow. and their children and wow. their children. Mm -hmm. So in that biblical tradition, you have what we've been talking about from the beginning of this, which is we are connected to our ancestors mm -hmm. and we are responsible to our descendants. Mm -hmm. That is the way to thread the needle. That is, the, that is a perfect way to describe how we honor our past by neither giving it too much honor or not enough honor. Because there is a pendulum swing that can happen. Uh, yes, on the one hand, as you said, there can be this fixation on the glory days where we just want to go back to the way things were. I mean, you think about the Israelites in the wilderness. All they really knew for sure was what life was like in Egypt. Right. And so they came, they they imposed this glory day mentality on being enslaved of all things. And so we can do that sometimes with our history where we say, oh, if we could just go back 
to where things were easier, cleaner, better, simpler, whatever. And on the other hand, we can give not enough credit to our history where you mentioned the word sort of this progressivist mindset or what some people have called a recency bias, mm, yeah. where what we know in the immediate past is a whole lot better than what it was like in the ancient days. And we feel like like history is in this upward trajectory where we are moving toward a pinnacle and much better, our life is much better than life was like mm -hmm. a century ago, 125 years ago. So you got these extremes. So what you're describing really is a way to honor the past as it informs the present, but while also being faithful to the present moment. Again, one of my favorite quotes that I came across over the last couple of years comes from a book called What We Owe the Future. And in that book, the, one of the opening chapters talks about an indigenous people who live in Bolivia and Peru called the Aymara tribe. Hmm. And what's fascinating about the Aymarans, if, if you and I think about the past and the future, we often think about the future as ahead of us and the past is behind us. So literally in terms of our anatomy, the way we think and orient ourselves in this timeline is future is ahead of us, mm -hmm past is behind us. I mean, who does our rear view mirror, our right. windshield, right? The Aymaras do the exact opposite. They think of the past as what's ahead of them. Mm. And they think of the future as what's behind them. And why? Because the past is the only thing they can see with clarity. Mm. It's the only thing they can see with their eyes. They can have a full vision of what's, what's already happened. What they can't see with clarity is what's ahead of them or is what's behind them yeah. in the future. So literally the Aymarans conceive of time as walking backwards into the future. I think about that a lot in terms of the life of faith, the legacy of our ancestors and our descendants. We, we can see with clarity what they've done for us, uh, but they could not see with clarity what we will have inherited, the lives that we have been entrusted because of their faithfulness. And that's a walk of faith. Mm -hmm. They were just faithful to the moment. And so we can't possibly see what our descendants will inherit from us. Mm -hmm. All we can do is trust, literally walking backwards into the future, that God can see them, that God has placed a sense of eternity in our hearts so that those who will follow us even though we can't see, I think I said this in the sermon, even though we don't know them, we can envision them because we can believe in the very same God who will work in their lives, just like God is working in ours, just like God has worked in our ancestors before us. Yes. I think that's a beautiful place to wrap up. Thanks so much, McGray, for that reflection. Uh, we'll be back next week with another edition of Beyond the Sermon. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Matt Hotho, and we'll see you next time.